in America this morning. It's Friday, September 16th, and these migrants didn't travel 2,000 grueling miles to own the libs. We start here. The Texas government was already bussing migrants up north. Now other governors are following suit. One of the migrants, when we were speaking with her, referred to a feeling of, of essentially being kidnapped. What happens when a political point lands you on an island off Massachusetts? Vladimir Putin answers to no one except perhaps the Chinese government. If you looked at some of the body language there, it was like uh, the puppy that had been disciplined. The Eastern Hemisphere's most powerful alliance might be more one-sided than you thought. And if someone's religion can deny you a wedding invite, what else is on the table? Can they be compelled to say a certain thing for a customer who wants them to say it and make it. A case over gay rights might not be a cakewalk for anyone. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. You know you're making an impact when people start copying your playbook. Earlier this year, Governor Greg Abbott in Texas enacted this new policy that for a long time had only been talked about. With migrants illegally crossing the southern border at record rates, some of them from countries where you can't just send them back to Mexico, the question was where to put them. She was just getting ready to leave for home, uh, and uh, she called me and said there were 50 refugees standing outside, and she didn't know what to do with them. Of course, many migrants come to this country and immediately make their way to their cousin that lives in Los Angeles or their father in Arkansas or wherever they can start working a new job and start their lives. But some of these people don't know anyone in the U.S., and some that do are so wiped out after this journey, financially, physically, that they stay put in whatever border town they've arrived in. Maybe they seek out the services of a charity or whatever shelter is on hand. One thing that we know for a fact, and that is there are maybe as many as 100,000 migrants who are across the border waiting to cross into the state of Texas. So Abbott, a staunch Republican, decides to start shipping these migrants elsewhere, basically offering migrants free bus rides to cities like Washington, D.C., and then New York City. Some immigration activists were confused. Like, if you're trying to discourage border crossings, why give people bus tickets to exactly the cities where they have relatives? But as the numbers escalated, they began to see their intended effect. They feel that they lied, they feel lied to, and they feel uh, betrayed that, yeah, this, this is not what they expected. Thousands of people dropped off in strange cities who would now be homeless if liberal mayors didn't put their money where their mouths were and show some compassion. We need help. We have not been ashamed to say that we need help. And all those who think we're not getting it right, they should come and show us how to get it right. What you've got now is a scenario where migrants have begun to overwhelm officials in New York, Chicago. Yesterday, Abbott sent another bus to D.C., which dropped people off not in front of a shelter, but in front of the home of Vice President Kamala Harris, prompting snickers and applause from the right. Well, yesterday, we learned another group of migrants had landed, not in a big city, not a major hub where they could continue their journeys, but on an island, Martha's Vineyard, the Massachusetts island where the Obamas vacation, accessible only by small planes or the local ferry. There was one other difference with this rather confused group of migrants. They had been sent by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Let's go to someone who is on the island right now. Julian Sear is the Massachusetts state senator that represents Martha's Vineyard. Senator Sear, can you just describe when you found out these migrants had arrived? Like, what happened? I received a call from uh, the sheriff uh, here on Martha's Vineyard, uh, who, who just an hour earlier, just after a little bit after free, three in the afternoon, uh, two chartered jets landed at Martha's Vineyard Airport. There was some level of coordination. Uh, actually, a, a, a camera crew was on site um, to, 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 to film uh, these migrants, mm. uh, migrant families who were disembarking from the plane. And, and these 43, 44 um, migrants uh, ended up at Martha's Vineyard Community Services uh, unannounced, essentially. Everyone was in the dark, including them. Somehow they understood they needed to go from the airport down to community services to find help. Uh, and they walked the two or three mile walk uh, together to do that, men, women and children to get there. There was no Which notification was um, to officials in Martha's Vineyard or really to anyone in Massachusetts uh, that these, these planes were arriving. We've got a, a tight knit year round community here on Martha's Vineyard. This is a small island of about 20,000 people. Uh, it's rural. It's actually a lot, lot, lot of work in 
working class folks actually live out here year round. Um, you know, really, really, the whole island scrambled. Um, we're here to help. This is an incredible community here. We've received calls from restaurants offering food, stores offering food, people offering space, you know, private people showing up saying, what can I do to help? Emergency management and first, re first responders, the sheriff's office, community services, Red Cross, Salvation Army and others um, basically stood up a, stood up a, a shelter uh, to provide food and, and, and a good meal and, and a safe place for these folks to stay, sort of the equivalent of what we would do in a hurricane or in a um, in a nor'easter, uh, did that in a matter of hours mm. and have been taking care of these folks uh, since. But this was something that was uh, completely unexpected. And, and, and we've since learned that this appears to be a, a, a cruel ruse. They were told in Texas that they were coming to a place that had jobs and homes and shelter waiting, uh, homes waiting for them. These migrant families were manipulated uh, into boarding these planes. Uh, commitments, promises were made uh, to them, um, assurances of, of, of work opportunities and others that, that, that were not there. Um, and this really sadly appears to be a stunt. Yeah, wait, I'm trying to understand this. A lot of these busings from Governor Abbott in Texas, they've appeared to be voluntary, more or less. These people show up, and Governor Ron DeSantis from Florida says, oh, actually, this is us. Like, Florida is paying for this plane full of people, but where are these migrants from? Like, are they from Florida, or and how do they end up on Martha's Vineyard? So, um, our understanding, there's been some really good reporting on this. Uh, Eve Zuckoff with uh, WCAI uh, spent a, a bunch of time speaking to the migrants last night, and, and we've had, uh, you know, conversations with them today, um, that, that these mostly were are, are Venezuelans uh, who had crossed uh, the border in Texas in recent months. They were in San Antonio in a shelter in San Antonio. Um, a, a, a woman that the migrants refer to as, as Perla, uh, approach them outside of the shelter. They initially were told by a woman on the street after asylum in San Antonio that they were going to be sent to Massachusetts um, and that there was a sanctuary there. Uh, and essentially recruited them um, with promises of, 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 of traveling traveling to, to this destination. Um, but, but they did not necessarily know where they're going. Uh, actually, one of the migrants, when we were speaking with her, referred to a feeling of, of essentially being kidnapped. This clearly appears, especially after seeing what Governor Ron DeSantis has put out and others, you know, that this was, you know, this was really um, a political move. The minute even a small fraction of what those border towns deal with every day is brought to their front door, they all of a sudden go berserk and they're so upset that this is happening. And it just shows you, you know, their virtue signaling is a fraud. Capitalizing okay. on, they on, you know, people in, in difficult circumstances for, for sort of a gotcha, a gotcha moment or a political stunt. Yeah, what was your reaction to finding out that this this does appear to be a deliberate plan by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who said, like, yeah, you guys are talking about straining the system to house all these people, to feed all these people. These are the same complaints we've got in border states. Like, you guys are getting a small taste of what we're dealing with. You guys have a couple dozen now. We're dealing with thousands and thousands across the southern border. I mean, you know, unfortunately, we, we've seen these fundamentally racist and xenophobic tactics before. If this were about um, providing relief to, to border communities who are overwhelmed or, or about um, providing, you know, safe harbor and care uh, to these migrants, uh, you know, the way that you do that is reaching out to, you know, is reaching out in partnership um, to other states and, and, and localities. Um, there was none of that outreach. You know, we've actually had experience uh, and have really stepped up uh, in prior years to support um, migrants in need. Uh, under Governor Deval Patrick several years ago, uh, Massachusetts welcomed hundreds of unaccompanied minors uh, who were at the border in coordination with the then Obama administration. Um, you know, so we, we've done this sort of work, but but unfortunately, you know, we've just, we've seen these fundamentally racist tactics before. Uh, and it actually even harkens back to the civil rights era. <laughs> The Northern Liberals and the NAACP, Urban League, and people like that especially, they have been crying the uh, sing-song in behalf of the Negroes throughout the nation. And of course, now when it comes time for them to put up or shut up, they have shut up. In the 1960s, segregationists uh, tricked uh, 96 Southern black families into relocating uh, to Hyannis. Hyannis, of course, being uh, close to the then president, uh, John, John F. Kennedy's uh, home, um, and, and and it was really an attempt to, you know, by the segregationists to to show 
northern white liberals as, as, as hypocrites. She was actually told that. The Kennedy was going to meet her wherever she was dropped off. And in Hyannis, she, she was thinking that they was going to be there. What actually happened to those 96 families, uh, the community responded and, and rallied around them. Uh, here on Cape Cod, they uh, helped them find homes, get settled. Those families stayed here and are, are, are part of our Cape community, you know, decades later. But it's just really a, a cruel, unfortunate, you know, very, very um, discouraging and disgusting thing uh, that has happened here. Well, so what is the plan? Like, are, are you guys planning to keep them in Martha's Vineyard or are you taking them on? Because we've seen this in other cities now, like in Chicago, we just saw a lot of migrants bust up there. And immediately the governor and the, the mayor there actually dispersed these people, bust them out of Chicago in some suburbs, which raised questions about hypocrisy. If it's bad to shuttle migrants around, then, then why are you shuttling migrants around there? I mean, are they staying in Martha's Vineyard? So, uh, you know, our, our capacity here on, on the island is limited, right? The, the current shelter where, where, where they're staying, uh, you know, this is a church parish that has, you know, one bathroom, um, you know, limited showers, right? This is not going to be sort of a suitable, a suitable place for people to reside for, for too, too long. We've got people on cots in the, the parish hall. We've got people on cots here. We've got families on air mattresses down in the homeless shelter in the library. We, as I said, we've had had experience with this in, in, in the past. Uh, I expect us to see us sort of dusting off that playbook and, and relying on, you know, the strategies and, and resources we used to help unaccompanied minors. It's probably unlikely that, you know, the current shelter is going to be able to continue for, for, for too many days more, just given the cramped quarters and, and the, you know, the limited, limited facilities there. Someone we're hearing from, from some of these cities like Washington, D.C. and Chicago as well. All right, uh, Julian Sear, thank you so much for the time. Really helpful. You're so welcome. Throughout this week, Ukraine has loudly proclaimed its big counteroffensive has retaken Russian-held cities several at a time. And earlier this week, you just kind of had to take Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky at his word. There was no proof backing these claims up. But that was before Zelensky started popping up in these cities personally, which were now proudly waving the Ukrainian flag once more. <laughs> So that's a headache for Russian President Vladimir Putin. Well, at the same time all that's happening, Chinese President Xi Jinping was on his way to meet personally with Vladimir Putin yesterday. A top of mind, of course, was Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And while each leader talked about how powerful their alliance was, there were hints that Russia now has to deal with concerns to its west and to its east. Colonel Stephen Ganyard is a former Marine and State Department official. He is now an ABC News contributor. Colonel Ganyard, first of all, can you just walk me through how important the last week has been for this war? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing about uh, the last week for Ukraine, Brad, is uh, is the momentum uh, that they have gained on the battlefield has been uh, doing working wonders for the morale of the Ukrainian people. Since the first days of September and until today, our warriors have liberated more than 6,000 square kilometers of the territory of Ukraine in the south and in the east. The advances of our forces continue. What happened is the Russians got sucker punched. For a month, the Ukrainians have been saying, we are going to institute a new offensive in around Kherson, down in the south yelling it to the world. We're putting all our troops there. That's where the offense is going to be. So what did Russia do? They pulled troops out of the north and out of the central part of the of the, uh, of the the battle lines and pulled them down to reinforce in the south. And the Ukrainians said, oh, okay, you're going to give us that opening because we now know that all of your defensive lines in the north are quite weak and you don't have the ability to hold that territory. And so this is why the Ukrainians literally blew through the Russian defenses in the north. Newly freed from Russian occupation, one local resident said she wept when she saw Ukrainian armored vehicles drive victoriously through the city. I could not believe my eyes. We knew that it was very hard to take our town. There are bridges all around. You can't approach it. There's so much to go in this war and, and no way to anticipate how it goes. But we do know that the Ukrainians now have the advantage. They have momentum. They have the will, which we see the Russians losing. Okay, so then I see why it was a big deal for Russia, of course, for Vladimir Putin. Where does China fit in, Steve? Like, why was it so important for Vladimir Putin in the middle of a war to meet with Xi Jinping at a big convention? 
Yeah. So, th- so this SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation, it's sort of um, it's a confab for all the people in Central Asia that hate the U.S. Uh, and are sort of allies with Russia and Putin. So the Russia, the U.S. sort of looks at it as sort of a bad guy convention. In comes Xi Jinping. His economy has weaknesses. As it de- as it cools off, it also has insecurities. It has food insecurities. It has uh, energy insecurities. And these are things that Putin can provide him. Xi Jinping is going to get something for the effort. If he's going to support Russia, he's got already some things that he's working on. One, we know that the Chinese are buying oil from Russia at a 20% discount. Like you become, you become our exclusive supplier for this thing at the price we dictate. Congratulations. <laughs> exactly. And so it's a pretty good deal if you're Xi Jinping because your economy is cooling and you're getting a discount on oil, which is going through the roof for the rest of the world. You're getting a discount on grain. You're going to get a discount on, on iron ore. All those things that your country needs to to survive and continue to grow, even at a reduced rate. Xi Jinping coming in, and he is setting the terms with Vladimir Putin. And if you looked at some of the body language there, it was like uh, the puppy that had been disciplined. Putin's initial statement going into the meeting with Xi had a very subservient tone to it. And he actually said, we understand that you have questions about what's going on in Ukraine and we'll answer those. He didn't need to say any of that. And obviously somebody on the Chinese side said, you need to make it clear that we have concerns about your behavior in Ukraine. But it made Putin look very, very subservient. uh, And it's probably set the tone for the whole negotiations, which probably were one-way negotiations. And does Xi Jinping care about the war in Ukraine? Is that part of the concerns or is it just grain prices and manufacturing it's it, it's always going it's always going to be the economy uh, but again he also has to uh, be able to answer to the world to say uh, when he threatens Taiwan why should why should Russia be able to invade Ukraine uh, because I should be able to to uh, take back territory that I believe is mine mm. so let me say it this way um, China believes that Taiwan is part of its country Vladimir Putin believes that Ukraine is part of old Russia and he wants to reconstitute the empire. So if she says, we get it, you were threatened, you have the right to go in and take Ukraine, what he's really saying is, when the, on the other foot, we have the right to go in and take Taiwan for the same reasons that Russia has invaded Ukraine. That's interesting that, that China, sure, like we'd like our grain supplies and everything from Russia, but more importantly, we need a rationale. We need a justification for perhaps waging our own war against a nearby group of people. And if that's not going well in Russia, it's a lot harder to sell in Beijing. Uh, Stephen Gander, thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. In Congress, there have been questions about how much to push on social issues in the days leading up to an election. Abortion for Republicans has been a big issue, but also same-sex marriage for Democrats, because Democrats are planning to put forward this bill that would enshrine same-sex marriage in federal law just in case the Supreme Court ever walks back its own ruling. I'm pretty, uh, pretty confident that on final passage, we will have the votes we need. Yesterday, we learned that Democrats will actually push that bill back beyond the midterms. It won't be voted on for a while, apparently hoping that moderate Republicans will come around to support it when there's not a big election looming. Well, in the months ahead, the Supreme Court is about to consider another case. It's not necessarily about the legality of same-sex marriage, but it could still have profound effects on the treatment of LGBTQ people and lots of other folks in this country. ABC senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer is with us. And Devin, you were telling me you'd visited the Masterpiece Cake Shop in Colorado. I was like, wait, I know that shop. I've heard of that one. That was the one that wouldn't make a gay wedding cake, right? Well, why are they back in the news? Yeah, Jack Phillips, who owns that cake shop, you'll remember, Brad, back in 2018, narrowed narrowly won his case at the Supreme Court. The question on the table, uh, of course, was could he turn away a gay couple seeking a wedding cake? What kinds of cakes can you not create because of your religious convictions? Uh, Well, I don't create cakes to celebrate Halloween or cakes with uh, profanity on them. If I don't 
If it's not something I will say, then it's not something I will write on a cake. The justices at the time, including a couple of liberals, said that the state commission that enforces civil rights law discriminated against him, showed hostility to his religion um, in their investigation. We were unable to continue doing the wedding cakes during that process. We're still not doing wedding cakes. So financially it cost us uh, because that was a big part of our business. But the court at that time did not address the more fundamental question, and that is on the table. Uh, this fall at the court in another major case. You look around at other people of faith like Jack Phillips and and looking at the way the state has treated Jack, um, of course there's concern that the state would do the same to me. It sort of feels like deja vu, but the court is going to decide whether business owners can refuse to serve you if they believe that doing so would violate their free speech. What do you tell people about what 303 Creative is? I am a custom graphic and website designer. I design one-of-a-kind pieces, sometimes logos, websites, graphics. Now before the justices is the case of Lori Smith. She's a website designer, also in Denver, um, and she wants to get into the lucrative wedding website business. Well, I am a Christian, and as a Christian, I believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. The only problem is, she says, that Colorado's law, the same one that was applied to Jack Phillips the baker, would penalize her for refusing to serve same-sex couples and design those websites. Um, When I consider a project, it's always about the content and the message I'm being asked to promote, never about the individual. She's not designing wedding websites at all right now. She doesn't have any customers. She hasn't offended anybody. She's challenging this preemptively, saying that she can't do it because she faces a penalty. Uh, So She's asking the justices to strike down anti-discrimination law in Colorado and say that people like her have a right to refuse to serve those gay and lesbian couples. I want to create freely and to be able to do that without the government imposing fines and other forms of punishment simply because they don't hold the same views. On the other side of this, Brad, is is the state of Colorado and Attorney General Philip Weiser, who says, look, this isn't about um, speech. This is about service. If you're open to the public, you need to accommodate everybody. That's a core of our civil rights law, and it has deep roots in American law. And that companies that provide services... They design websites, they bake cakes. They need to do that for everybody, regardless of who you are. If you create some exception to this public accommodations requirement, the idea that if you open your doors to the public, you have to sell to everybody, then that exception can expand. The state argues that uh, they have an overriding interest in protecting that access and that people like gays and lesbians in their state, but potentially religious minorities, ethnic minorities, could also be impacted if exemptions uh, are handed out. Yeah, because I was if someone's saying... You know, this is part of my identity. I can't change it. By the way, it's legally recognized. And someone else is saying, yeah, well, sorry, my religious beliefs are part of my identity. I can't change that. Like, who went? Like, how do you reconcile this? Yeah, it, it, it's really a collision of freedom of speech and whether you think that these creative services, can they be compelled to say a certain thing for a customer who wants them to say it and make it? Uh, it's an open question. If a wedding website designer says, I will sell Christian websites that have biblical verses on it, they can choose to design their websites, design their product as they want. What they can't do is say, if you're a same-sex couple, you can't have this website. If a Jewish baker says, I'm creating traditional Jewish delicacies, that's fine. But that Jewish baker can't say, I only sell to Jews. They have to sell to everybody. That's what our civil rights laws require. Wedding services are obviously the high-profile examples we talk about, right? I mean, given the religious exemptions to same-sex marriage, that makes sense. But the fear from LGBTQ advocates, Brad, is that um, this sort of discrimination based on the customer and the quality of their sexual orientation, gender identity, could spill to other areas. Haircuts, landscape design, clothing design. Imagine sitting down in the barber's chair and the barber looking looking at you and going, you know, I don't do transgender haircuts, um, and oh. uh, and this is an art. Or like, that's what a boy's supposed to look like, and I don't agree with that. I'm not servicing you today. And my service is a form of art, creativity. I speak huh. through the type of hair design that I give you. I will not do that. That's the type of slippery slope that these groups are worried about. 
So there's anxiety. We're watching situations in other states, a lot of sort of more conservative states, like actively legislating against transgender folks. And, and of course, there's so much on the line uh, for minority communities, and in this case, LGBTQ Americans, because discrimination, particularly in the wedding space, Brad, is pervasive. Uh, you know, one study from the Legal of Journal uh, Studies took a look at religious exemptions around the country, and they found that um, they would significantly impact uh, these communities and, and estimate about 60 to 85 percent of same-sex couples already experience discrimination when shopping for wedding services. Right. And we know the Supreme Court is going to hear this case. We don't yet know when. It would be sometime this fall. Then that means you'd probably likely get a ruling early next year. Devin Dwyer, thank you. Thanks, Brad. And one last thing. It's one of the questions every elementary school kid has asked their parents looking up in the sky and that parents promptly either make up or admit they don't know. The question is, where did Saturn get its rings? Don't feel bad if you don't know. It turns out scientists don't really know either. But now some researchers from MIT and UC Berkeley think they've got an answer. There are two mysteries that have been plaguing astronomers for decades. That's Lisa Grossman from Science News. And she says those two questions are, why does Saturn rotate at such a weird tilt? And of course, how did it get the awesome rings? The study that came out yesterday suggests those two things might actually be related to each other. The answer, at least according to these researchers, is that Saturn must have had an extra moon. So Saturn has all these moons. Uh, NASA thinks there are 82 known moons, there could be more. And it might have had 83 or more at some point. At one point, these scientists say, this 83rd moon could have been big enough that it helped yank Saturn's access to that weird angle. And now that Saturn was tilted, this moon was slingshotting around so hard that eventually the moon smacks into the planet and bursts into lots of fragments. The rings could be all from this one moon that was orbiting like normal and then and then had a really bad day and got absolutely shredded by Saturn's gravity. Now remember, it's not like there's ever been a photo of this hypothetical moon. Scientists basically had to dream it up. They ran some computer simulations, and the results seemed consistent with what we see today. They even named their simulated moon. They invented this moon, and they called it chrysalis um, because it kind of evoked a butterfly to them that like the, this moon was was orbiting dormant the way that a chrysalis is kind of dormant while something is, is waiting to emerge from it. And then like a butterfly coming out of its chrysalis, then this, the rings came out of this moon. I was gonna say, cause then Saturn becomes like a model. Oh yeah. Saturn goes from the, the you know, caterpillar gas giant to the definitely the butterfly of the solar system. <laughs> One of Lisa's favorite details is that Saturn, we know, is about 4 billion years old. This simulation posits that its icy rings only came into existence 150 million years ago. In the cosmic scheme of things, Saturn hasn't looked like this for very long. So that's way younger than we thought. It's young enough that if the dinosaurs had telescopes, they might have seen Saturn without rings. Meaning, no matter how old you are, it's never too late to get a glow up, and it's never too late to put a ring on it. At one point, I also asked her, like, why are they all flat, these beautiful rings? And she was like, Brad, that's that's how every planet is. Just it spins and things all go to the same plane. I'm still learning every day. Start Here is produced by Kelly Therese, Jen Newman, Brenda Salinas Baker, Madeline Wood, Vika Aronson, Iru Ekpanobi, Cameron Chertavian, and Tara Gimbel. Ariel Chester is our social media producer. Josh Cohan is director of podcast programming. I'm our managing editor. Liz Alessi is the head of ABC Audio. Thanks to Lakia Brown, John Newman, and our intern, Ania McLean. Special Special thanks this week to Chris Berry, Nadia Drake, Nate Luna, Jonah Haskell, Armando Garcia, and a very special thanks to Lewis Millman, our producer who's put together some of the most memorable segments on this show, the true jack of all trades at ABC Audio, whose smarts have really made this show better at every turn. This was his last day working with us, and Lewis, we can't wait to see what you do next. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm off early next week. I'll see you soon. Amber Rose Isaac was the love of my life. She went into the hospital. And then I just see Shimani is... She was as good as dead as soon as she walked into that hospital. Black women are four times more likely to die than their white counterparts with the same symptoms. I can't let Amber be another statistic. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else. This fight is not over. We're doing this together, man. 
as of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. ABC News on the internet 24 hours a day. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is our commitment at ABC News to being America's most trusted news source. And so here's to celebrating 25 years of groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. Here's to everything ahead. ABC News, America's number one news source. Good morning, I'm Deirdre Bolton in New York. And I'm Diane Macedo in London. We have special coverage of the funeral of Queen Elizabeth, but we're also watching the day's other top stories, including an immigration showdown. President Biden is slamming the governors of Texas and Florida for busing and flying migrants to liberal strongholds like Martha's Vineyard without warning. The president says the governors are playing politics with human beings. The governors say their states are bearing an unfair burden. We have the latest.